All right, we are getting into a much more interesting field where creativity is extremely difficult to nurture. It's the public sector field. Uh, the next panel is creativity for public and social services, and uh, social innovation is now part of uh, policymakers' jargon in, in every day. But how did they actually do it? Uh, let us introduce our panel two facilitator, Ada Wong, founder and honorary chief executive of the Hong Kong Institute of Contemporary Culture. Thank you, Ada. And also, Professor Anthony Jung, President and Chair Professor of the Public Administration of the Hong Kong Institute of Education, as well as the non-official member of Executive Council of the Hong Kong SAR Government. Kim Soko, Head of Efficiency Unit of the Hong Kong Government. And Dr. Edmund Lee, Executive Director of the Hong Kong Design Center. And our respondent for this panel is Simon Robichaud, Director of Sangbox Digital and Creative Industry Media Factories, University of Central Lancashire. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Ada. Thank you, Vincent. Um, since we are you know, quite uh, short of time, uh, I, I hope we can go straight into the speakers. In the last session, you heard amazing stories of creativity for business. And as Vincent said, you know, this uh, session is about creativity for the public and social services. Um, I remember Dirk said in the last session, you know, in fast-changing Hong Kong, it seems nothing ever changes. I think that speaks for the public sector as well. So um, perhaps I will have to start with, uh, you know, Professor Anthony Chung, um, who is an ex-co member as well as the president of the Hong Kong Institute of Education. And let's hear what Anthony has to say. Can um, someone help Anthony with his PowerPoint, please? So over to you, Anthony. Thank you, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for the sake of time, I try to be very brief with the PowerPoint, which unfortunately is a bit wordy. Um, in, in my presentation, basically, I'm trying to make two points. First, to make a case for creativity in public and social services, which I would call PSS. And secondly, to argue the case that for creativity in PSS, actually, the job should not be left to special teams. We are not talking about creativity teams, creativity consultants. We should be asking for creativity from the ordinary. It should come from the day-to-day -day operations within PSS. So these are my two arguments. Um, I recall that, I think it was uh, Bernard Shaw who said uh, uh, something to this effect, that for many people, we see things and we ask why. And he said, I dream, dream, I dream dreams and ask why not. So I think this why not should be the foundation of creativity. Why not should be the foundation for imagination. And creativity is about Creativity is about applying imagination to purposeful activity. There is a purpose for creativity, problem solving, and um, to generate results which should add value, should create a positive outcome. Now, you have heard a lot about these points, so I'm not going to repeat. Uh, I think the, the, the main purpose of this slide is uh, we're all talking about creativity. Creativity is the catchword. And uh, we have heard keynote speakers uh, talk about creative industries, uh, the professions, artists, painters, and so on. But I'm trying to echo what the first keynote speaker said, that everyone uh, can be creative. So the question is whether the system, the ambience, the environment is conducive to uh, releasing uh, that creativity. What about why creativity is so important for public and social services. To start with, PSS, uh, these services are essentially human services. We are talking about human beings. We are dealing with people. And if PSS is to succeed, uh, such services should serve to care, to enlighten, and to empower. That's the, 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 the 
objectives of PSS. The, so how can this be achieved is what creativity is about. PSS embody the values of humanity, helping people, restoring human dignity in the person, addressing social ills, um, uh, uh, inadequacies, vulnerabilities, improving the social structure. So all this call for how to create uh, an outcome where individuals can really fully express themselves, can be empowered. Uh, PSS should bring hope and confidence. So you can't have hope, you can't have confidence without creativity behind. Uh, PSS is about solving problems, about improving uh, uh, the living conditions about delivering better outcomes. So we call, f so this call for uh, smart solutions. So in a sense, PSS is a business of creativity. So that's my starting point. So, this, so it's not something added on PSS. The fundamental, the core value, if you like, of PSS is creativity in, in the broad sense. Historically, uh, particularly in public administration, we appraise uh, PSS in terms of economy, efficiency, effectiveness, efficacy, or equity. But I think increasingly all these dimensions could be uh, uh, brought within the broad framework of creativity. And um, at the end of the day, we should ask, what do we like to see out of public and social services? The qualities of the people people becoming wiser through education, through whatever we are doing to enhance human capital, less dependent, even in terms of welfare, we don't want people to be continued dependent on the system. They need to be independent and to be more responsible. And very often this cannot be achieved by just continuing to, imp to provide more of the same services or functions. So the very, uh, the starting point of creativity is to, 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 to question this presumption that by providing more of the same, things will be fine. So, so we are really trying to go beyond uh, the modus operandi. And PSS, uh, is a, the, the, the whole process of PSS is to transform. To transform people who are the target of, uh, of, of PSS. And uh, we have to tackle the, the root. The root problem has to do with the structure, the mentality, the values of the system, and uh, which produces and reproduces ills, inadequacies, deficiencies that require PSS interventions. So we are talking about breaking the change, the existing chain, breaking the cycle. And you can't have linear thinking, conventional thinking, if your job is to break the cycle, is to break the chain. So creativity is about how to transform work, leisure, community, and everyday life. This is uh, a, a phrase from uh, uh, Robert Farida uh, in his book, uh, the, uh, the, the, class of, uh, the New Creative Class. And we, we have to go to the fundamental, to the culture of the, of the problem, uh, and therefore we, ha we must have new ideas and new ways of doing. Now, I won't go into detail of this slide. Uh, these seven essential ingredients of uh, creativity are taken from a, 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 a report uh, written by um, uh, Jane uh, Steele and Kerry Hampton in 2005, Unlocking uh, Creativity in Public Services. And if you add a B after UN, then you have unblocking creativity, meaning roughly the same. So, so these points about curiosity, motivation, vision, diversity, understanding, use of information, because sometimes imagination has to come from information and confidence and stamina. I, I think these are sort of ABC for creativity. But the important thing is thinking the unthinkable. Thinking the unthinkable in two senses. First, uh, why not? Right? Secondly, whether you are prepared to go against the tide, the system, the rules, the procedures, the, uh, the, the conventional wisdom of, of things. Whether um, the system is able to produce people, managers, frontline staff, workers, uh, that 
who, who, who are prepared to question assumptions and establish policies, explore new possibilities, allow new perspectives, to allow. I think the word allow is very important. Sometimes we reject new possibilities and, and uh, new interpretations. And for PSS, there must be a very strong uh, public service ethos that motivates people to improve the change and to believe in change. And I like the, what the previous speaker uh, at the previous panel has said, because change is constant. This is what uh, we believe in. So we have to have the urge to be creative. At the same time, we have to make way for creativity to be unleashed. So we, we have to overcome some hurdles. Inertia, being too comfortable or feeling too comfortable, always opting for the traditional solutions. Now in government, for example, very often, People will ask, okay, if you want me to solve this problem, give me more money, give me more staff, more of the same. Not daring to question the modus operandi. So when you do things, there must be a standard. We must have meetings. So can we ask, can we do things without meetings? Can we have meetings without minutes? Now, these are questions that we should ask. Uh, we are sometimes too compliant, uh, opting for complacency, uniformity, Sometimes success is the reason for failure because we are too, have been too successful uh, in the past. I, I remember someone at the previous panel said, well, Hong Kong, there's a lot of moving but no change. So that, that's the problem of being too successful. Uh, creativity has to overcome uh, hurdles, but creativity also comes at a cost. Uh, the cost of challenging the status quo, uh, the cost of displacement of old beliefs and skills. Uh, very often we have all kinds of vested interests who survive, who, who, who thrive on the existing system. So we are, we, we are endangering them. And sometimes we are also endangering ourselves, the whole uh, raising death row of what we are doing. So are, are we prepared to, to challenge all of that? I think that, that is also important, particularly in PSS, because very often there are standard ways of doing things. Now, in another paper, uh, 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 The Benefits of a Culture of Creativity from um, Richard Beresford from um, Oxford Brookes University, he said, if creativity is to survive and flourish, it needs to be embedded within the DNA of an organization. So the question is whether we're able to build that DNA in. Now, my, my uh, uh, point is, in PSS, particularly in the case of Hong Kong. Very often, the structure is quite bureaucratic. So in a sense, we are question, very often we are questioning all the ingredients of a bureaucracy. Uh, uniformity, uh, complacency sometimes, uh, standard uh, uh, operations. And, but creativity needs to be facilitated and homegrown. Because if you just rely on outsiders, consultants coming in to advise what to do, that is not creativity. That's imposed creativity. That's manufactured creativity. So whether the organization itself could generate its own creativity. So we are, we, are, we are really urging people within PSS to ask themselves, well, this is what, how we do things. Can we do things differently? Uh, I, I read this report from um, uh, the, the, the unblo un un Unlocking uh, Creativity report that I mentioned earlier. So it was said that there was a case study, a, a project, uh, London Heathrow Airport. Now, there are many uh, people who like to watch airplanes. So the police initially thought that was uh, a risk to security, particularly after 911. But then later on, they discovered that actually you can make use of these people to help to look out for uh, uh, suspicious items or suspicious people. So they became partners. I mean, they support the police. Now, this is somewhat like what we in Hong Kong invented, I think, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Siu Lin Geng Sun, the young kids who report things to the police, checking cars, registered numbers that are said to, be, to belong to lost cars. Um, so I think it is from what we are doing that we can discover new ideas, new perspectives. So we, we need an organization that is learning, that is thinking, and of course that is uh, creative, and that is able to, to take risk. Now in Hong Kong, in PSS, actually, we have a lot of exa past examples of um, sorry, past examples of being innovative. Uh, I've talked about the police just then. 
Let me give you an example. Uh, the traffic warden scheme. Nowadays, traffic wardens, they are not police people. That they wear uniform. Initially, it was the police that was responsible for sort of um, uh, uh, traffic uh, um, um, uh, doing what the traffic wardens are doing now. But the, f the first suggestion to take the job, the, the function out of the police, that was very unconventional. They had overcome a lot of cultural resistance within the force and then, I mean, the, the, the conventional uh, wisdom. Um, so in PSS, I think uh, what we need to uh, advocate are two things. First, the way of doing things. I mentioned meetings. Can meetings be more creative? Uh, the public service particularly is good or notorious in producing a lot of forms. Can we have simpler forms? Can we have uh, simpler procedures? Uh, in public administration, when we talk about deficit in implementation, one argument, one theory is that there are too many clearance points, many, too many steps. So can we reduce the number of steps that would reduce the cost of implementation? But we need more trust. Uh, because if there is more trust, then there's less need for control. Control costs a lot of money. And um, so that's one point. Secondly, the people. Because PSS is about changing people. Now, in uh, public services or social services, there, there, there are standard relationships between um, the, 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 the service provider and the service recipient. Sometimes the, the recipients are dependent on the um, uh, providers. Sometimes they are to be controlled by providers. So my point is, can we turn the, uh, the people from problems, liabilities, costs? Because these are how they are normally categorized. In a welfare organization, you have to help people. So these people are dependent on you. In the police world, these are suspects. These are people who cause trouble. Now, is there a way to turn these people from, prob from being problems, liabilities, costs, into assets, into resources? Now, that's how we can generate uh, new energy. And uh, here, uh, at the last point on this slide, uh, Chris uh, Christopher Hood, uh, his classic book in the 1976, The Truth of Government. He, he identifies four different types of uh, resources. N, nodality, information. A, representing authority. T, treasure, money, use money to solve problems. O, organization, for example, using the army, the police. Now, if you use the recent, uh, the, or the, still the current controversy in Hong Kong about how things were done during uh, Vice Premier uh, uh, Lee's visit to Hong Kong, now, I'm, I'm not commenting on the case. I'm trying to say, okay, if we face a situation like this, how do we make use of the tools of, of government? How much information should be used? How much organizational force should be used? How to balance these four resources? These are important. So very often in terms of uh, creativity in PSS, I think we should be asking, how can we combine different resources available to service providers, to government, in a slightly different way? Because that may make, mean the change. So my final point, because of time, my final, sorry. My final point is, every organization, if we treasure, if we value, if creativity, perhaps every organization should do a SWOT analysis. What are the... Your, your strengths and weaknesses in terms of being more creative. Are there opportunities that you missed? What are the threats to becoming more creative? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. I think we see similar ideas in the first session. Nick said, you know, creativity can be disruptive. Anthony said creativity will upset the status quo. And um, the word efficiency and effectiveness um, is no longer enough. Our next uh, speaker, Kim Sorkel, is, however, the head of uh, Hong Kong government's efficiency unit. So I'm wondering, Kim, after today, perhaps your unit should be called the Creative Efficiency Unit or Creativity or Innovation Unit. That sounds more like the 21st century, right? So uh, over to Kim. Thank you. Yes, uh, like one of the earlier speakers, I find it much easier to 
think and speak on my feet rather than my posterior, so I'll stand up here. So you can see me at the back. Yeah. I represent the efficiency unit that often sends chills through people. Very often we're seen as a branch of the treasury out to sort of try and find some way of extracting money out of organisations rather than giving them help. Uh, I'm here to say things differently. One of the things we're trying to do is discover how can the iPad be used more creatively within government to free people from their desks, to get away from the technology, and actually go out and meet people. Well, I won't be using it too much. <laughs> We've got a lot of learning to do. Um, I agree very much with what um, Professor Jang has just said. I would. I invited him to speak at a conference we had just last year. Um, I think he's put the importance of public service to the whole economy very well. Um, very simply, I take it as axiomatic that it matters greatly to the whole of society, business, families, individuals, that we in public service do our work well. To create that framework of decent laws, decent services, decently administered that gives them the freedom and opportunity to exercise their creativity and go about their lives well. And to do that, we also need to be creative. I have no doubt at all that there is the talent within Hong Kong coming into the public service to make Hong Kong's public service very creative. One of the most enjoyable parts of my work is greeting young people coming into public service, or actually going out and talking in some of the universities to people who might come in, and seeing the enthusiasm that's there. I also see at the formal level, the leadership in the government, talking about the importance of creativity and innovation. Again, last year in November we had a conference on what public service might need to look like by 2020 by which time over half of the current public service will have retired. Big change. Current Chief Executive talking about the importance of managing that change creatively, taking advantage of the opportunity of this new generation and the ideas that they're bringing in. We had Professor Birgit Mager giving a very strong presentation about the, the value of creative design to tackling really intractable social problems of drug addiction, long-term homelessness, prostitution, public libraries. Very interesting ideas there. And as I go around areas of public service, I'm very encouraged to see lots of signs of innovation coming in. A few months ago, I went on a JP visit to Tumman Hospital, to their geriatric unit. Wonderful things they're doing there. And getting in students from Hong Kong Polytechnic to help them improve even further. Lovely signs of networks building up. I see the post office experimenting with how can they make their counters and things work better for the different kinds of customers. Very interesting stuff that Social Welfare, Labor Department and Employees Retraining Board are doing out in Teen So Wai to recreate the way that employment and support services for people who find it difficult to get jobs going on. Food and Environmental Hygiene Department, never recognized as very creative. Look at their internet memorial site. Brand new service, good stuff coming in. Even e-billing under the government portal. Again, simple service, nice idea, make things available. But I've been delighted at the willingness of people to take the time and think, not just, oh, this is a nice service, it will be better, but is that really so? Can we get to understand the way that people will interact with it and make sure it is something that they can use well? And through that simple process of taking a bit of time before launching it, we've gone from a prototype that only about 10% of the people who came to meet it could uh, work with it well, to one that we're launching where 100% of people are saying, yeah, this is super, it's easy to use, it's simple, making the form simpler as asked for. I also sense that out in the sort of outside formal government, in the um, social services sphere, there's a lot of experimentation and innovation going on there as well, in how to reach out to youngsters at risk from uh, drugs, how to redesign housing and um, social support and healthcare support for the elderly. But having said all that, I do still sense that the scale of change that's taking place within government, the creativity and innovation, is not commensurate with the scale of change in society and the need in society outside. At times of massive shifts in society, which this city, along with all others, is going through, it's more vital than ever that governments and the public services show themselves in new ways as being relevant, necessary, and deserving of trust by society and by individual citizens. 
my background is a his historian. And while I think it's important to understand the differences that the present has compared with the past, and not try and repeat the past, still there are words of advice and warnings that need to be heeded from past episodes of, of great social change. Now, this year is the 100th anniversary of the revolution in China. At that time, leading into the revolution, China itself was going through huge transformation because of the way that railways and telegraphs were changing the way that people, ideas, and information could move around the country. Huge investments in education and industrialization were again changing patterns of society, changing expectations that people in society had. Now, the Qing government was behind a lot of those investments, encouraging them. But it wasn't investing very much in its own development. It wasn't changing its language, its assumptions, and its practices to connect with the spirit of the age. And where today I see the greatest value in creative design applied to public services is not so much because of improved service efficiencies that it brings, but much more because the discipline in the process is bringing our attention to the language and assumptions of the citizens that we're seeking to serve. And it's helping us to translate the language and actions of government into words and symbols and actions that resonate with the public. Uh, there's always a lot of talk about oh, the need for better communication between um, government and public. But frankly, you can't have better communication without better substance to communicate. And I think this is where good creative design comes in. Not just improving the design of the service itself, but improving the words and actions that we use to explain and connect our services with the public. So I think that there's no doubt that in Hong Kong, We've got talented people. We've got the, the sign from the leadership that they want public services to be creative. We've got the huge opportunity from the generational shift that's taking place. But again, I'd emphasize, I think there are two areas of responsibility that have to be accepted by public servants if the potential opportunity is to be fully realized. And the first is an individual responsibility, both of all civil servants already in public service and people coming in, uh, we're picking up on what Anthony Jones has said, not to be conformed to the norms of the organizations that have been created, but to keep in mind that our primary duty is to serve the citizens and attend to their needs and thinking. Yeah, we have to work within organizations, but we must be focused on the society and not on the needs of our internal organization. With that, there's then a responsibility on the management of public service organizations at every level, not waiting for some directive to come down at the top, but each of us within our own areas of responsibility, however limited, to be creating the expectation on ourselves and on the colleagues around us that we will be open to innovation and breakthrough in services and to develop and sustain cultures within our teams that do encourage that process of the systematic learning and the thinking on that learning from which creativity can come. So on that score, it's really my personal responsibility and that of my unit to find ways to help and encourage and sustain that attitude to openness and innovation across the rest of the public service. That's a super task to have. Uh, we've done a number of things. The, the 1823 Citizens Easy Call Service, that's a new service we created 10 years ago. More recently, we set up the youth portal to experiment in ways, how can you make public information and public services relevant and interesting to young people? But also, how from doing that, to learn how young people think and want to interact with government now and perhaps 10 years ahead, so we can pass on that learning to other parts of government to help them improve service. We are next year going to move into uh, new offices we're again looking at how do we create an interesting environment for our own staff, but also to create space for an innovation lab. We perhaps won't have jellyfish in it, but we will have other things that again, provide a physical space and a social space in which our own staff can interact more easily both with other colleagues elsewhere in government, make it easier for them to 
Here's a place where we can innovate and try out ideas, do rapid prototyping with less risk, because it's perhaps someone else is doing it for them. And if it works, then take it on and, and spread it more, for, more widely. As it, it's a big task, and I'm delighted today we will have others who can help share ideas of what more and what better we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I know Kim is uh, very dedicated to what he does, and he has already done you know, great things at the Efficiency Unit. Our third speaker is Dr. Edmund Lee from the Hong Kong Design Center. Edmund will talk to us about what design can do, and I think he'll be showing us a few case studies. So, Edmund, please. Okay, thank you very much, Ada. I will sit down here so that you know even the, the, the speakers can, can have a glimpse of some of my slides. Now, um, I'm going to talk about, you know, the, um, how the use of design can create value. In fact, no design center is not there to promote, you know, the uh, superficial, the, uh, the aesthetic things. We're talking about, you know, preaching to the society, uh, the strategic use of design to create value. And uh, it is not just a, a way, you know, to whether you like it or not. We are, we, are, we are preaching that, you know, this is a value creation tool, cross-disciplinary, work across, you know, to, uh, 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 um, can, uh, create benefits, in not just economic value, but social value. But we need to, um, to have the link um, 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 using design uh, between creativity and innovation. Now, um, before I launch into you know, the design for social or public innovations, I find it compelling you know, to at least uh, give you a glimpse of what design thinking is. Because uh, we, this is you know, the central core element of, of why we exist and why you know, even you know, um, the Ivy League business schools in America are teaching design thinking to executives in their uh, uh, education modules. So from OEM all the way to OSM, you know, we're talking about how we can create value from the form visualizes all the way you know, to like uh, the Apple system. The whole company creates a market, okay? The whole organization is geared and engineered for innovation, high power, you know, ideas and, and, and implementations. And um, there's uh, many, many elements that you can work on. You know, even Dirk, you know, talk about um, design could be utilized, you know, for marketing, you know, the designing for effective communications program with stakeholders. There are many different elements that cut across product, process, services, you know, just to list out you know, all the elements. Now, the important thing at the center is most of the time, you know, we tend to forget because um, people doing their work is always almost like, you know, uh, at the wall and uh, we lose sight of what you know, the outcomes are we trying to create, and importantly, the impact that we are creating. So if we don't have sight of those things and clear, clearly you know, have the, the values communicate to all the people and the stakeholders, we will just continue to do things and, and get ourselves uh, 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 just be, being busy. Now, last year at Design Center, you know, we invite our, uh, uh, Professor John Haskett you know, to even um, train some of our staff on design thinking. And one thing you know, that you know, we uh, um, um, strongly uh, take note of, these days you know, when we try to connect you know, the, the design to the user groups, we have to manage the interface. Okay? Because we're talking about the business executive, we're talking about designers, that we're talking about a lot of groups of people in it. And we are talking about different languages, and we are trained in different ways. So we need, you know, to manage, you know, the interface. Now, are we ready for the creative economy? In fact, towards the end, I would say that, you know, I I rather not ask this question: Are we ready for the creative economy? I just want to show you a few uh, visuals. And um, Hong Kong is ranked top fourth in the global exports of creative goods, according to the UNESCO report in 2010. And I trust that, you know, that uh, value, you know, combines both export and re-export value, okay? And um, the creative industry is contributing a not insignificant percentage to the GDP, I would say. And we have an increasingly vibrant art, culture, and design landscape in Hong Kong, okay? I think some of the previous speakers talk about, you know, the urban settings. And it's not just the West Kowloon uh, uh, projects that we're talking about. We have many alternative art spaces, you know, spaces for exhibitions, educations, a lot of things is happening. Um, uh, uh, in the community. Our opportunity in the creative economy, apart from, from OEM adding value all the way to the OSM, we must capitalize and capture these global and regional developments, particularly in mainland China markets. Okay. 
Creative League is not just for the Gen, uh, Gen Y, you know, the younger people. All of you sitting in this meeting room, you know, could be part of the Creative League. The question is, are we prepared for it? Okay, and um, and at the end, we talk about, you know, we would like to um, to see more strategic use of design within the government, design for social innovations. The, the slide at the uh, bottom uh, uh, right-hand corner is um, taken um, during a visit uh, I took last year with Rita Lau to uh, visit Denmark. And um, at the Danish Design Center, there was a project poster capturing the use of design thinking and design to improve health service delivery. Okay, And we are talking about a lot of you know, social problems, even uh, aging, a lot of you know, violence problems, a lot of you know, issues that require an orthodox and different way of approaches to solve problems and very complex and many stakeholders involved. And all the traditional methods that you use, I would say that you can throw them away. We need to think differently, okay? And the Creative League, you know, we need to inject energy, you know, obviously the young people is very important and that's why even at Design Center, you know, we, we, we cannot ditch, you know, the direction. We, in fact, we invest more efforts, you know, to uh, uh, the direction you know, for the youth program, and together with the Make a Difference uh, Youth Program, you know, championed by by Ada's uh, uh, Ada's uh, uh, Institute, I think the younger people these days have a lot of interesting, exciting opportunities in Hong Kong to get inspired through case sh uh, sharing and, and 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 lectures, you know, on how they can make uh, things different, not just to benefit themselves but to the society. Okay, we want to see more story like you know to linking designers with the local SMEs. This is a very interesting case. You know um, the, the local companies involved is an uh, OEM company. All the way along is only making screws, making parts and components you know for other brands and other companies. And then you know at uh, one of our BODW uh, uh, forum they start the cutting process for two years. Okay because they don't have the language. So th these people start talking but no sparks. But at the end they managed you know, to create you know, some beautiful furniture and it's being enlisted um, in one of the luxury um, um, furniture store um, and for sales throughout the world. Okay, the next session is talking about the creative mindset, so I'm not going to, to say more. The three slides on the vertical row is uh, some of the visuals uh, commissioned by Mercedes-Benz a short while back. Talking about the left-right brain interactions, okay? Most of our business executives are trained on the left brain. But on the right, we're talking about style, we're talking about creativity, we are talking about different things, you know, how we can have passion, you know, use passion, use energy to inject into what we do, okay? And then how we could create, co-create, strike partnerships with people, and also at the same time, work across disciplines. Who told you that architect, architecture has no bearing to, you know, uh, uh, our current uh, living these days? Okay, my previous uh, slides actually show design can actually help us to improve life. Okay, we want to have an urban setting to live, work, and play. So everything around us, all the disciplines are related to us. Okay, now look at, you know, the, 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 the gentleman, uh, Yves uh, Bahar, obviously is, um, is a well-known designer there. But design brings story to life. You know, all these phrases, design for society, for better living, better leaders, better citizenry a better world to live, work, and play. You know, all the designers, all these creative people are using all these phrases, beautiful. The important challenge is how can we measure the impact? But for people going for design for social innovations or public services delivery, the impact is what we are going after, okay? The design city, you know, the theme, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the project that we're working with, RTHK, also covers culture, uh, uh, the young people, you know, all the design knowledge and everything is what all other cities, you know, the eight cities that we feature in the film series actually cover. Okay, now I won't talk about all this, but eventually how we could use design thinking to create economic and social values. And I'm sure that I don't need to uh, further elaborate on all the bullet points there, how we could eventually get to see more strategic uses of design. We've been running award scheme for years at Design Center, Design Leadership Award. Okay, from Samsung, obviously, I don't need to explain to you. And then last year, you know, to Sir James Dyson. But the year before, you know, we actually awarded to Kika Heath from Denmark. Okay, and apart from his achievement, it also sends a message, designed for social innovations. Index at Denmark has a track record of doing projects 
uh, using design to improve life. Okay, so it's not just creating dollars, you know, to, uh, uh, for commercial value. It can do a lot of social goods, you know, to people. Okay, and even in Hong Kong, we've been working on embrace design thinking and design without knowing it. For example, the diamond taxi, you know, project, you know, to, uh, um, um, is one good case. And then you know, we have local architects actually helping, you know, uh, 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 um, 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 uh, disprivileged people, or even relief projects like Earth after quake, you know, building bridges in China, and uh, and, and and designers working on projects on upcycling, giving lives to materials that you're going to throw away. Okay, so there are lots of things that you know that we can use design, you know, to 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 uh, 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 create solutions. Now, just a quick run of uh, two projects that we are working on. I think one of them, uh, uh, Kim, just uh, uh, touched on. We are working with post office on a project. And, and to literally inject design thinking in, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, the park project, I, I covered the park project first. And we try to use design thinking you know, to work on the park uh, signage, furniture, and user experience. And then the second one is on post office, obviously, how to enrich user experience, enhance operational efficiency. Now, maybe to you, is, uh, is a renovation project, what is it so different? And this, you know, we're actually going through the process, which is very interesting indeed. This is what design thinking is all about, starting from fact collection, starting from research, how we dig out the insights, identify the opportunity, ideation, involving different stakeholder groups, including operational staff working on the floor level, you know, to inject ideas on how things can be done better, develop concept, prototype implementation. And then we get into some of the interesting experience, which I take a lot of credit, uh, credit you know, to uh, uh, the post office team and you know the uh, uh, the LCSD team, you know, of colleagues there. And design management is an <laughs> unfamiliar territory because uh, the the system, the government is working on the system, and we are focusing on the experience. We are talking about the outcomes, and most of the time it's very easy, you know, the natural training and the the, the the habits is immediately go into the process. Okay, procurement, you know, we can't do this, we can't do that, you know, this is the way it works. Now, what we're trying to work together is, the first of all, we must have a champion. Without champion, we cannot actually get through the project. Second, we have a joint uh, steering committee, and that uh, provides joint ownership and advice, you know, right from the beginning. It's nothing like, a, you know, arm's length, you know, uh, positioning with us. If you want the project to succeed, then post office or LCS2 has to work closely with us, okay? And then, you know, we'll do all the planning and everything together. We have long hours of meeting. We ask the question, can we skip some of the meeting? Can we skip the meeting? We can't, okay? But at least we try, you know, to work over some of the thing without losing sight of some of the user experience and the outcomes that we are bearing in mind, okay? And then how to manage diverse expectations and accepting risks and manage, managing them. Now, there are other projects in Hong Kong, just have a glimpse of that. And it's also touch on, you know, the social innovations and in, interestingly, what we call PPP, public-private partnerships as well, okay? Like, you know, the PMQ, you know, the project that Design Center is working with PolyU and the DI and try to convert these former police quarters into a creative quarters, okay? So we are trying to, uh, it's going to be a good venue, you know, to, uh, platform, you know, to, to do some of the social and business innovations there. And end of the day, we want it to be a fun place to live, work, and, uh, and play in it. We, collectively, Hong Kong, are on a mission. We want to deliver impact, okay? Now, just look at, you know, I'm not paid to do any advertising, okay? But just look at, you know, some of the um, um, learning environments that we now have in Hong Kong. We haven't had that yet because it's being built. Hopefully, you know, to, um, um, that you know, center, uh, 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 innovation tower um, of Polytechnic University will come on board uh, um, sometime next year. And then you know, we have CTU, you know, the School of Creative Media, designed by uh, Daniel Lipskin. Okay, and then we have DI, you know, the, the fantastic, you know, to, uh, uh, campus designed by Thomas uh, Kodafi. All this building, you know, to, even you know, the SCAD used to be a magistrate building. Oh, this is a fantastic different, you know, to a uh, learning environment. But end of the day, you know, it's, um, the speakers, I fully agree with the speakers, it's part of the urban setting, but that is not enough. 
we need you know the softer part of it, the programming, you know the contents. In fact, you know we are literally throwing questions to how we could uh, train students and even you know practitioners to be better prepared for the future. Two years ago, we started planning you know, this um, um, creative ecology exhibition two years ago, and last year we had that uh, um, 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 held in, uh, during the Shanghai Expo uh, in Shanghai. And at the time, we were thrilled you know, when, when John uh, published a book on creative ecology. So that literally you know, um, 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 converged on the thinking that Hong Kong has a lot of dynamics and interactions um, of design you know, driving developments. And most of the time, you know, we need to leverage on Excuse me. You know what we have. You know to um, um, create a better setting. You know for all of us. Okay. So instead of asking the questions, um, 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 is Hong Kong uh, ready for the creative economy? In fact, I would say, are we prepared? Are we well prepared for the the the, the opportunity presented by the creative economy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Edmund. And I would add, you know, do we have enough champions? Uh, you know for. Uh, creativity in the public and social sector. Uh, I think I think you all in this room are in leadership positions. Uh, you, you know you you hold resources and you have the power to say yes or no. So are you ready to take the risk? And uh, can you find a partner in uh, like a design center or the universities in Hong Kong or elsewhere? Uh, we have one respondent, uh, Simon Robert Shaw. Um, he's director of Sandbox Digital and Creative Industries Media Factory at the University of Central Lancashire. So, Simon, could you perhaps tell us, um, you know, uh, what, what you do and perhaps, uh, you know, so sharing some insights and do you, how do you interact with the public sector in the UK? Yeah, I'll be uh, brief because <laughs> I think we're running out of time. Uh, Sandbox, although it is attached to a university, it operates on a, as a commercial organisation. So we facilitate workshops for a range of clients, everyone from communities right through to uh, to local services, to police forces, to the health service, to the private sector and to universities as well. So we touch on a, a wide range of sectors indeed and of course change is a, a key element of all of those areas that we come across. It's interesting seeing the two previous speakers from the previous panel actually because I think the public services can learn a lot from the private sector actually in terms of how they operate and work with people. And that's what we find when we work with our, with our workshops, whether that's a police force or whether it's the National Health Service. Um, the word, and Kim used this word uh, before, and I think it's a word that we don't use often enough in creative circles, is trust. Because trust is an, awful, an awfully important word when we're engaging with the public, our users or our audiences, but also trust with our own employees as well. Because if creativity is to grow, uh, as was outlined before, in those services, there has to be a level of trust with the people within the organisation to allow them to do that. And that is one of the key factors that we find hinders public services in the UK, the lack of trust in their own people within the organisation themselves. Because when we meet police forces, uh, believe it or not, or the National Health Service, it's often a question, can I do this? Yeah, it's not, uh, where do I ask for permission to do this? rather than I should be doing this for the organisation. Um, and briefly, because I know I have to finish, just a couple of things I'll point you at. One is the Design Council's work in the UK. Uh, they've been working with a lot with the pro uh, public sector organisations and produced some really astounding case studies. Um, there's also been a report by Nesta this year in March 2011 around innovation uh, in public services that was based on a Nordic report um, that I can provide details for people if they're interested in that. Um, and finally, um, I think one of the key elements um, that is important and maybe important to think about, and I'm not suggesting this is the right thing to do, um, but there's a bit of work that Nesta are doing on now in terms of the measurements or metrics for innovation in public services and how we measure that impact. Um, and I think that comes back to what we're talking about users and engagement as well and building that level of trust. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll be quiet now because I don't want to run into my workshop time this afternoon either. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. I think this should wrap up the session because I have been told that um, time is short. Uh, I would like to thank our three speakers and Simon as the respondent. So thank you very much.